Welcome back to AM. It is great to have you with us this morning, 11 minutes away from 8 o'clock. You can't trust Luxon. You can't trust National. That is the message the Prime Minister and his senior ministers have been pushing when TV cameras are fixed on their faces in the last few months. It's an attack line that seems to have worked, at least on personality, with Luxon trailing Hipkins slightly in the Prime Ministerial favourability rankings. But with just over three months to go until the election and bogged down in a scandal of their own making, how much can you really trust Labour? We're going to put that to the test this morning with the Prime Minister Chris Hipkins, who joins us live from the Beehive. Prime Minister, good morning. Good morning. Um, how important is it to you providing a safe workplace? How much of a priority is that? Oh, it's, a, it's a real priority for me. Um, as the previous, in my previous role as the Leader of the House, um, I was involved in you know, the implementations of the uh, review findings from Debbie Francis that found that Parliament wasn't a great workplace for a lot of our employees. I'm, I, I was never satisfied with that. Um, I think that is something that needs to change and as Prime Minister I'm committed to making sure we continue to change the culture of this place so that people don't experience the things that they've experienced in the past in here. Okay. Given that it is a top priority for you as Prime Minister, why are you going to wait two weeks to talk to a senior member of your Cabinet who has been accused of bullying behaviour? Uh, because when somebody takes a bit of time off, um, particularly after they've been under a lot of pressure, that's something that I respect. Um, I think that you know, creating a good working environment means treating everybody with respect, um, and that's what I intend to do. OK, why are you not able to speak to the Minister? It doesn't answer the question. That she's not on stress leave, we're being told, it's not a mental health leave. Why can't you pick up the phone and talk to her or Zoom like most of the rest of us do? Um, we've had some conversations over the phone in the last 24 hours, and I'm sure that we will have more. Um, but I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm reserving some of that conversation until we have the opportunity to meet face to face. What difference does it make whether you're face to face? This is a top priority for you as Prime Minister. You've got a minister accused of some pretty serious bullying behaviour and you need to do it face to face. Is that because you want to get rid of her face to face? No, um, it means that I want to be able to sit down and have a conversation with her and I'm not in the position to be able to do that at the moment um, and so therefore I'll, uh, you know, I'll reserve that conversation until I'm in the position to be able to do that. Can you not fly to her? Can she not fly to you? Um, as I've indicated, she's taking some time off. I respect that. Um, that we had a conversation about that yesterday. Um, I've encouraged her to take some time off as well, um, and that's where the matter sits at the moment. Yeah, but you're the Prime Minister. This is a top priority for you as Prime Minister, creating a safe workspace. You've got senior public servants who have come out so terrified of being vilified for saying things anonymously, senior public servants to the media, about her shouting and yelling and berating staff, and you're telling me that even though it's a top priority, you can't have a conversation with her because it needs to be in person and she's taking a break? The well-being of everybody in this building is a top priority for me um, and that is something that I will always make my top priority. When did you first hear the allegation from this senior public servant that she yelled so loudly you could hear it through the phone and that she berated a young, another young staffer? When were you first made aware of those allegations? Um, I, when I was away last week, I, I think the first I learned of that was when they were reported in the media. OK. And so you didn't have any prior knowledge of those allegations at all. What have you done up to investigate those allegations? So the feedback that I had, and it was conveyed through the media as well, was that the relevant employers of those staff members were satisfied that those issues were resolved at the time. So in the absence of any further complaint or any further, you know, people raising these issues further, um, there's not a lot that I can do about that. I, ultimately, you know, anonymous allegations that are made through the media aren't something that I can necessarily um, investigate or do anything about. If anyone wants to come forward and raise a confidential complaint, um, then of course they can do that. No one has done that. Okay. So Andrea Vance at Stuff wrote the story. 
if this senior public servant with decades of experience um, is willing to, would you talk to her about Kitty Allen's behaviour? Would you start investigating that way? It would depend on the nature of what they wanted to raise. If it was to do with employment matters, uh, then I would certainly make sure the relevant person was sitting down and talking to them about it. And it may be the departmental chief executive, depending on the nature of what was raised. But certainly, if anything uh, gets raised through a formal channel, and that doesn't have to be a written complaint, it, it means someone raising it with their boss or with their manager or with their chief executive, or in, you know, in the case of people in this building with the chief of staff or with the minister, um, then of course we will make sure that that gets a, a proper hearing and that the issue is adequately resolved. doesn't mean everyone will be happy at the end of that, okay. but there will be a proper process around it. Okay. It's purely a behaviour thing. She is very aggressive with people. I've had her yelling and screaming at me, at me on the phone so loud that my staff in the room could hear it. Um, this is the behaviour, alleged behaviour, of a senior member of your cabinet and you keep saying this is a top priority for your government, but you've done nothing to investigate this particular claim. I mean, what, why not go and ask, try and find out who this person is so that you can have a chat to them and then have a chat with your minister if you really want to take it seriously? Because ultimately the feedback that I had from the relevant chief executives um, was that they were satisfied that those issues were resolved at the time that they were first raised. Um, now, where you've got the people who are the actual employer saying that they were satisfied the issue was resolved, I'm not sure what I would be doing over the top of that. Ultimately, the responsibility here sits with the employer. Um, there are clear rules around how all of that operates. Um, and in this case, the employers are saying that they felt that the issue had been adequately resolved. OK. Do you, have you asked her whether this behaviour has continued beyond that one incident? Are you aware of any others? Uh, as, I, uh, as I've said, these issues um, were some time ago. Um, if there are any more recent um, concerns that are raised, then I will certainly make sure have that they are adequately her? addressed. Have you asked her if there have been? Uh, we, we've had several conversations, but I'm not going to go into the detail of that until well, I've not? had a chance to sit down with well, her. Hang on. I'm not going to go into the detail of that until I've had the chance to sit down with her properly and have a conversation okay, about that. Let's be really clear. This is the Minister of Justice. This is your Minister of Justice. You've had a conversation with her about whether she has used this type of behaviour subsequent to the examples that have been quoted in the media, but you're not going to tell us what the answer to that question is. Why not? How is that open, honest and transparent from you, Prime Minister? Because, because everybody is entitled to a fair process and that includes Ministers of the Crown. So it's entirely possible from after this conversation that, that the conversation that you had with Kitty Allen included her admitting to more of this type of behaviour? No, that certainly didn't happen. So she didn't, she didn't say that there was more of this type of behaviour that would be found? Um, no, she certainly has not indicated that. OK. If you, if you were to find more evidence of this type of behaviour, would that be something that you'd want to get rid of a minister for? Um, I've made it very clear to all of the ministers in the government that I lead that I expect everybody in this building and that they are interacting with to be treated with respect. That does not mean that there won't be disagreements and that there won't be passionate disagreements from time to time. That's the nature of democracy. But you can still do that and treat people with respect. Let's talk about the cataract surgeries, the postcode lottery that has been at play. We've spoken to, uh, well, we've heard from an eye surgeon actually today who says they are sceptical about there being more cataract surgeries because of this announcement. Obviously, hospitals and staff under pressure as it is. Can you tell us when there will be more surgeries? Is that the idea of it? When will we have more surgeries and how many? So one of the things, there's a, I guess it feels like there's multiple steps to this process. The first is to identify the extent of the need, um, making sure that everybody around the country is treated equally is the first step to doing that. At the moment, if someone lives in one part of the country with a, with a particular clinical need or another part of the country with the same clinical need, they may or may not get access to the wait list depending uh, on where they're living. That's not fair. So we fix that, make sure everybody gets equal access to the waiting list. That will then identify where the extent of the need is around the country and it will mean that we can make sure that the extra funding that we've got available to do more of these surgeries is targeted to the right place. That can involve working with private clinics for example to contract in extra capacity if we need it. It can involve moving people around the country if we need to in order to make sure that everybody gets their fair access to health care um, and it can make sure that you know everything is properly prioritised so that we're doing as many of the surgeries as possible. The intention then is to expand that to other areas of the elective surgery uh, wait 
lists so that everybody across the country is being treated equally. That hasn't been happening under the old health system. So when and how many surgeries? When, when will we see more cataract surgeries being done because of the changes you're making? By what date and how many? Uh, I've, I'm not going to put a particular number on it because, of course, it will exp it depend on where and it will depend on who's eligible. But the work, the work is underway at the moment to scale up the number of surgeries being done in this area. OK, so we'll, we'll, we'll hope that something happens at some point. The Greens rent cap announcement that they've made, uh, would you go ahead with that? Would you go along with that or just not rule it out at this stage too early? The experience of rent caps internationally is that they don't tend to result in a better deal for renters. They can constrain rental supply, which itself has a price impact on the level of rent that people will pay. Um, and so it's not something that the government has considered or been willing to consider. All right, Prime Minister, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Prime Minister Chris Hipkins with us live from Wellington.